as you've heard from Rachel and Kevin, none of this work raises any concerns at the policy level or <laughs> ethical level, but we've asked Robbie to join us anyway. Um, Robbie Barbero is the Chief Business Officer at Ceres Nanosciences, which is a diagnostic biotech that, as coincidence would have it, is developing a non-invasive test for Lyme disease. Is that still part of your thing? Okay. Um, from September 2012 to January 2017, Robbie worked in President Obama's White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where he developed and implemented policy on life science issues, including the Brain Initiative, the Precision Medicine Initiative, and genome editing. Um, so, Robbie, tell us, if you would, about how the work that we're hearing about this evening um, intersects with policy considerations. Great. Well, thank you very much. So, um, I am actually a total CRISPR neophyte, all right? So, I do have a PhD in bioengineering. However, I got my PhD six months before the first CRISPR paper was published, <laughs> all right? So, I thought it was, uh, and I had spent 12 years at the bench doing doing research before that. Uh, I thought I was extremely knowledgeable and relevant in my own field until six months after I left the field, <laughs> the whole thing got turned upside down. <laughs> um, so luckily, uh, you know, my co-panelists here have already talked about a lot of the technical capabilities and the interesting science here. But I, what I'm going to do is try to describe to you what it was like to be a biological engineer with over a decade of laboratory experience in commercial and academic research settings, who had the privilege of working in what was arguably the most pro-science administration ever in American history, at a time when a once-in-a-lifetime discovery is made in your very own field, okay? So I didn't pick this, it just, I happened to be the one who was sitting there when it happened to me. And the way I'm gonna try to, to, to illustrate this for you is to walk through a timeline of events. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is weave together, and this is all publicly available information, right? So if you're hoping for, uh, another tell-all, I'm not a, I'm not a novelist, I don't have anything there. This is just publicly available information. Um, but it's the advances in bioengineering that we've been discussing today, activities that the administration was working on related to biotechnology and biosciences, and because uh, the purview of issues in the White House are everything in the entire world, some of the world events that were occurring at the same time, which were beyond our control, unrelated to bioengineering, uh, in many cases, but in many cases, totally sucked the oxygen out of the room for some of the stuff that we wanted to be working on. Okay, so I've never done this kind of timeline approach. Uh, if you all start falling asleep, I'll, I'll skip, skip a few steps, but let's get started. Okay, April 2012, put down my last pipette. All right, done, have not touched a pipette since then. No more lab work. Summer of 2012, moved to DC for the science policy fellowship that I got to go work in the White House. When I joined the White House, I asked my boss what I was going to work on, and he asked me if I was familiar with Richard Hamming. Does anybody know who Richard Hamming is? Okay, so he was a researcher at Bell Labs, the amazing place that generated all sorts of innovations um, in the middle of the 20th century. He used to ask his colleagues, what are the most important problems in your field? And they would answer, and then he would say, what are you working on? <laughs> Apparently, this would annoy his colleagues because it would force them to confront the fact that they were working on something that actually wasn't that important. <laughs> so imagine me, right? Just a few months before, I had been worried about what concentration of salt to use in the buffer for the experiment I was going to run the next day. And now my boss was telling me, someone with no prior policy experience, that I had to find the most important policy problems in my field, understand them well enough, to figure out what some solutions could be and then be ready to brief the President of the United States on them. Okay, so August 2012, first CRISPR paper published. I didn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> December 2012, genomic cruise missiles makes the list of Science Magazine's top breakthroughs of 2012. But, to be honest with you, that whole section, it didn't make the top, it didn't win, right? It was one of the runner-ups. Uh, and that whole section is focused on zinc fingers, which were discovered in 2002, and talons, which were discovered in 2009. The article talks about how researchers have made engineered pigs that are useful for studying heart disease. And then it briefly covers CRISPR, and it says it might hold promise as a replacement for talons at some point in the future. I did read that. February 2013, 
Paper, a paper demonstrating the use of CRISPR in human cells is published. Okay, now it's starting to get real. I didn't read that paper either. <laughs> April 2013, President Obama announces the launch of the Brain Initiative, which is focused on developing new technologies to help understand how circuits of neurons lead to the emergent properties of the brain, like memory and learning and cognition and uh, health and disease. Since then, it has grown into a $1.5 billion initiative that has uh, received bipartisan support. Starting in early 2013 uh, and continuing for the next four years, I actually did what my boss told me to do. Uh, I started to talk to as many people in my field, in government, in industry, in academia, saying, what are the biggest problems in our field? What is not happening that should be happening? What are the things that need to be done? What could the government do? Lots of ideas. Got a lot of input, a lot of great ideas. Um, Around the end of 2013, right, so it takes a long time to get the uh, most important people in your field on the phone and ask them good questions and, and try to understand what they're saying. Uh, near the end of 2013, the unreadiness of our biotech regulatory system uh, for the future products of biotechnology starts to, to rise to the top of this list of feedback that I get. Although I will note, nobody in that entire year told me that CRISPR was going to change everything. Okay, so this is a full year after the publication of the first paper and at least half a year after the publication of the second paper and nobody is telling me this is going to change everything. Um, there's lots of discussion about cheap DNA sequencing, DNA synthesis, some discussion about talons. All right, so I'm still trying to figure out what, what are we supposed to do? Is there anything to do here? So spring 2014, that is the point when the number of publications pertaining to the use of CRISPR actually surpassed the number of publications pertaining to the use of talons, right? So one of the things you're trying to figure out when you're sitting in a large organization is, what is the problem? You know, is this a real problem or are people just, is it a shiny object that people are chasing for no reason? Um, and so looking at publications is a great way of doing that. Um, so it wasn't until nearly two years after that first publication that the scientific community started to show through their own output that this was a real thing. Okay, so right around that time, I initiated an effort internal to the US government to begin evaluating the readiness of the regulatory system for future biotechnology products. Then, in the June of 2014, Edward Snowden gives thousands of stolen documents to WikiLeaks, which end up totally dominating the news and all of the attention of everybody in the United States government for months. August 2014, CRISPR for gene drives first proposed in Science Magazine. August 2014, James Foley is beheaded and the video is released. ISIL and the caliphate continues to grow, in part by disseminating propaganda through US-based social media and tech tools, right? So that, you would think it wouldn't matter to OSTP, but guess what? They're using our technology to move things forward. So all of a sudden the White House is saying, what are we doing, what are we doing? Not my portfolio, but still taking up a lot of oxygen. August 2014, the WHO declares a public health emergency for the largest Ebola outbreak in history. It starts in West Africa, but it reaches Europe and the USA. Tens of thousands of people and ultimately end up being infection. It makes it to the US. It lasts all the way to the, till 2016. And remember, I'm, a, I'm supposed to be running an internal effort to figure out what we're going to do about biotechnology and the products that are coming. October 2014, government shutdown. Healthcare.gov crashes. January 2015, we launched the Precision Medicine Initiative, which grows into a uh, $1.5 billion initiative with bipartisan support. February 2015, Scientists call for an international discussion about the use of gene editing in humans. So this is almost three years after the first paper, and now the scientific community is saying, hey, guess what? The government should do something about this. <laughs> um, spring 2015, civil war in Syria totally dominates the news. Spring 2015, Russia invades Ukraine. That takes up a lot of attention. March and April 2015, the National Academy of Sciences, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and the UK Royal Society plan an international human gene editing summit. Around the same time, the White House and the NIH both articulate that human germline editing is a line that should not be crossed for now. July 2015, finally, we're able to publicly announce that we are going to be initiating a set of activities to modernize the US biotechnology system. And it's actually not even focused on humans, it's focused on 
plants, animals, and organisms. And we have a whole plan, three, three different activities we're gonna do, multi-year effort. This is just the start of the process, right? So it's taken us this long to just get to be able to say we're gonna publicly do this. And then in the fall of 2015, Zika outbreak. Rapid increase in microcephaly cases. By December, uh, WHO connects Zika and microcephaly. And the first microcephaly case in the US happens in January of 2016. December of 2015, Human Gene Editing Summit happens. Remember the one with the Chinese and the UK and the US? And there's a statement of principles released by the scientific community about what the appropriate use of gene editing in the human germline is, right? So whether we can pass it on. January 2016, the administration announces a cancer moonshot initiative. Remember, Vice President Biden's son died of cancer, and so there's a push to do something around there. It ultimately grows into a nearly $2 billion initiative with, uh, with bipartisan support. February of 2016, Gene editing is put on a list of weapons of mass destruction by the Director of National Intelligence in the annual Worldwide Threat Assessment released by the United States government. I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> June 2016, the White House Organ Summit uh, is something that we organize out of our team where money and policies are announced on focused on reducing the organ transplant waiting list, including, as you mentioned, the use of biotechnology as a, a potential future way to address that. So now this is, you know, this is, we're almost at the end, remember? 2016, <laughs> the clock is counting. It's, we're down to days, not years left in the administration. And we still haven't done any of the things that we said we were gonna do in this space. Finally, in September of 2016, we released a five-year strategic plan and we put out a draft of the update to the policy that the federal government uses to regulate product, products of biotechnology. Um, however, because of the fact that we live in a democracy and we feel like input from experts and from the public is important before you finalize any rules and laws, we allow the public to comment on that. So we've just put this out in September and now we have four months until we walk out the door to get those comments, incorporate them into the final version and then finalize it. In October of 16, 2016, we have our final big science event with President Obama. We host a Frontiers Conference to, to explore the future of innovation across five themes. I, I have the privilege of being one of the people who gets to organize the medicine and healthcare uh, track. Kevin gets invited to come talk. Um, the plenary features President Obama and several guests talking about the future of medicine and healthcare. And we actually time this with the release of an issue of Wired Magazine that's edited by President Obama. Then in January of 2017, we finalize our update to the federal policy around how biotech products are gonna be regulated. And I leave the, the building six days later. All right, that's it. <laughs> are there questions from the audience? In the front. I would like to ask each of you what you think the future is and the future I'm defining is the next three years. Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'll narrow my answer to where gene editing touches the world in the, in the next three years. Um, and I think in the next three years, we're going to see it tip of the iceberg begin to transform medicine. Um, already today, there are open clinical trials where patients, a small number of patients, are beginning to be dosed with therapies that are using CRISPR gene editing uh, to treat sickle cell disease, for example, uh, or to treat certain kinds of cancer. There have been for many years other trials evaluating other kinds of gene editing technologies. And so I, I think this is the beginning of, of what will become an entire new wave of medicine. You know, as, as you think about medicine today, Really, you get prescribed uh, a small molecule, usually in the form of a pill, or an antibody. Uh, those, those are really the two pillars of drugs today. And I believe that within a fairly short period of time, there will be three pillars, and the third pillar will be gene and cell therapies. And gene editing will be an important component of that. Robbie, I loved your overall description because it illustrates what is wrong with the way we approach the world is that we get distracted by these momentary political crises when the way we live today is overwhelmingly shaped by technology. And it is future advances in technology. It is the technologies that we invent and 
our wisdom in deciding whether, when, and how to use them that will overwhelmingly determine the future of our civilization. And that means we need to talk about how we go about doing that. The next three years, I'm hopeful that we might see some change with that, although it's probably not necessarily for good reasons, because we have increasingly access to these technologies is very widespread. We've already had certain rogue scientists in the news for doing unethical things. And as you start getting technologies that can unilaterally affect large groups of people, combined with our tendency to get distracted by momentary concerns, I think we're probably going to be forced to think a little bit harder about the way that we develop and use technology. I, I, I will just say that I think um, we will see an increasing number of plants and animals and microbes that are being genetically engineered. Whether those make it into widespread you know, release into the marketplace or consumer applications um, remains to be seen. But there's no, my company doesn't do genetic engineering or any of this stuff, so this is not based on inside knowledge. But I mean, my read on all of this is there is, there's so many people and companies working in this space, so many products being developed, so many applications being pursued. I think we'll, you will see an increasing number of things showing up in every part of your life that have been gene edited by technologies like, like CRISPR. And it'll surprise you, things that you didn't even expect would come from gene editing.